Good morning, Year 8. What we are going to look at today, a bit of geography, um, and let's look at our title. So our title today is Why are aquifers important for feeding people? So can we get that title written down? Pause if you need to, a minute, but why are aquifers important for feeding people? Before we introduce sort of the key words and the key learning from today, what I want to start off with is a simple little do it now, which has two parts. Firstly, what I'm asking you to do is have a look at the five questions here. Okay, so section A, five questions. You can just do these in notes form. You don't need to write nine sentences. Secondly, I want you to answer the second two questions using diagram B here. Uh, sorry, using the diagram here, which I've circled you. Okay, um, and I want you to answer these in sentences to get us used to writing and to get us used to developing our ideas. So the first one, how many gallons of water are needed to wait, make one almond? So that's the almond there. And there's going to help you there. Second one, at half time in a football match, all the players and the three referees, so that's 11 players per side. Okay, so that's 11 plus 11 plus however many referees there are, are given a quarter of an orange. How many gallons of water were used to grow the oranges? It's a bit of a math riddle, this one, so you're going to have to work it out and go through it as you go. Pause the video and get that done, please. So let's switch to a red pen or a different colour pen if you've got one. And let's have a go at marking these questions. Which river is also known as Old Man? Okay, and that is the Mississippi. So make sure we spelt that correctly. We did a lesson about this a few weeks ago. Next, the American author, the important, the influential, the one I say who is like Shakespeare in American literature, is Mark Twain. Okay, Mark Twain is very important in sort of American literature and American history. Which ocean is California next to? It's next to the Pacific Ocean. Dams control water flow, but also stop what from moving down the river. Well, silt is the key word I wanted here. But if you've got soil, you can have that. I'll accept mud. Okay, you could maybe talk about animals. But silt is that sort of sediment that's carried in the river. Okay, that when it um, go, moves downstream, it fertilises. Okay, and if that's held up, it damages and it can um, inhibit the um, sort of river downstream. Then how many waterfalls make up that Niagara Falls? That is three waterfalls. Now let's have a look at the long answer. To make one, to make one almond, 1.1 gallons of water required. Okay, as we can see here, one almond, 1.1 water needed in ga gallons. Okay, so that's that's dead straightforward one. Now we'll move on to the next slide and we'll talk through the football match. Okay, hopefully I've got it right. If not, please feel free to email me and I'll correct it. So the first thing that I think we need to work out here is well all the players and the three referees so 11 add 11 okay plus the three that gives us a number of 25 so we need 25 quarters okay of the orange now that means okay we need 6.25 oranges now as I hope you know you can't grow a quarter of an orange you need to grow a whole orange they grow in holes okay so to grow we need to round that up Okay, because that's kind of the way it works in this riddle. Might be slightly different in maths, but in this riddle, okay, we're rounding it up, which means we then need to sow seven oranges. Okay, so we want to grow one orange, we need 13.8. So we then put through seven times 13.8, and that's 96.6. Okay, if you've got that slightly different because you've rounded up some numbers, this number, I'll accept that. Okay, but that's pretty much the number we're looking for. Let's move on. So our lesson today is looking at something called aquifers. Now, in order for us to be able to understand and sort of fully access this lesson, what we need to really understand is what an aquifer is. So I'd like you to write this slide down in a minute, but I need you to listen first of all. An aquifer is a body of permeable rock which can contain groundwater. Let's unpick that. So an, a body, that means an amount. Okay, so it's an amount of rock. Permeable rock okay, is a type of rock which has small holes or gaps that allow water and other liquids to pass through it. So if you imagine my hands, okay, I don't know if you can see, but there's all sort of little gaps there, aren't there? Imagine in them little gaps, okay, water could fill in. Okay, if it's impermeable, it's more like that. Okay, so locked together and there's no gaps. So an aquifer has permeable rock, so there's these little gaps and little pockets. Okay, which can contain, contain groundwater. Now, groundwater is water that's underground. Okay, so an aquifer is this huge, 
potential storage for water underground. OK, so what I'd like you to do now is can we write down this sentence? Can we write down the bits around it and draw the arrows okay, to the bits that I've sort of marked on with the yellow highlighter? So now we've got a rough definition of an aquifer. I want to show you what it looks like in a bit more detail, okay, which will hopefully help you understand it um, and in your head know what we're talking about because it's quite an abstract, quite a weird idea. The diagram A shows a cross section of the high plains Ogallala aquifer. Okay, so don't worry about this for now. Okay, this is just the name of one. We're going to talk about that in a second. So the bottom, okay, so we'll start off with, uh, we'll go for blue. The bottom, okay, this is bedrock. Okay, this is impermeable rock. Remember that? Impermeable, so it's locked together. Okay, so water can't go any lower than this. We then have the saturated zone. Okay, this is what's called the saturated zone. And we'll go for, let's go for yellow for the saturated zone. Okay. The saturated zone, which is where permeable rock, okay, so remember the rock with like this. Okay, see the difference? Okay, it's got them gaps in it, them holes in it, holds water. Then there's the water table, which we'll have as red. This fluctuates depending on the season. So the water table changes quite regularly. If it's, a bit, if it's um, winter or spring and there's lots of rain um, and lots of snow melt, the, um, the water table is naturally deeper. Middle of summer, the water table is shallower because obviously that water has been naturally drained away. Whereas that saturated zone below it, okay, that's very old. Above this is the unsaturated zone. So this is sort of the um, top layer. So it's not, it's, it has some moisture in, but it doesn't have that much in and it drains down or it goes straight out. Um, for that one, we can just use green. Combination of soils and permeable and impermeable rocks. Limited water is stored here. Green section, and as you know, that's what you would see. Okay, I'm looking out my window now. That's what I would see. Okay, that gives us a bit of an idea. So this bit here, okay, the yellow bit, is what we talk about by the aqua. Okay, this impermeable, uh, this, sorry, this permeable rock, it's got these gaps in, okay, which means over time, water can fill it and water can fill it and water can fill it. Now, when we talk about time, we're talking millions of years. I'll say that again, millions of years. Okay, it doesn't just fill in like, you know, the mug. Okay, it takes millions of years for it to gradually fill and fill and fill. Okay, because that's really important. I want you to remember that. Now, the part of America that we're talking about today is a part called the um, Ogallala Aquifer, which is also known as the High Plains Aquifer. Now, this little simple map here breaks that down for us. OK, so what we've got, it's kind of this region here that we're looking at. Okay, right in the, you know, if this was a dartboard, right in the middle. OK, this river here, I'm hoping you can remember what it is. OK, this is the Mississippi. We've talked about that already. We've got the Pacific coast here. Here's California. We've talked about that. Okay. The Rocky Mountains, they're the source of the Colorado River that we talked about a few lessons ago when we talked about damming. Okay. So all of our bits that we've talked about with America so far are starting hopefully to click in and you start to see how you know this one country has all these different issues. One of our future lessons is going to look at a little bit up here. Okay, it's going to be one of our future lessons. So if you've got the information, if you've printed it off, okay, follow along, annotate it as we go. If not, don't worry. Like every lesson in history and job for you guys, I'll read it to you. The High Plains are part of American history. The first white settlers going west to transform the plains from buffalo hunting grounds into rough pasture for cattle, the land of the cowboy. So when we talk about cowboys, we hopefully you know what a cowboy is. Hopefully you've got some experience what cowboys are. It could be when you were a kid, you played cowboys. Okay, you could have seen the films on TV very often on BBC Two on the afternoon. Okay, but the cat this takes place in the high plains. Before the white people arrived in America, when it was just the Native Americans, the indigenous population, they were used to herd buffalo or to chase and to hunt buffalo. Okay, what happens as it says here okay, is they were changed by the white settlers and they were turned into pasture 
for cattle. Pasture is farming land, okay? So like grass that the cattle can eat. Then came the plough, and pasture became dry prairie. So the plough, okay, that's an agriculture, a farming tool, allows you to turn the land, okay, um, and turn the soil into something or somewhere where you can grow crops. And they did this between roughly 1850, okay, up until the 1930s, until the droughts and the dust storms of the 1930s. So what happened was they overused the soil. The soil lost its nutrients, which meant it dried out. It dried out when storms and winds whipped over it. Okay, it carried it away because it wasn't being held together. It hadn't had the nutrients and it didn't have the water. Okay, as a natural source to hold it together. Millions of sharecroppers abandoned the land and trekked onto California. So they abandoned, they left what they had, they left their farms because they, they, they couldn't grow anything. They were getting poorer and poorer and poorer. So they left to California, which links back to our last lesson or one of our last lessons. We think about the demand on California and how much more water they need in California, but the fact that they're going through the drought. Since then, the arid plains, keyword, they're arid, and it's dry. We talked about it a few lessons ago. have been transformed once again through the pumping of water from a giant underground reserve discovered beneath them, the aquifer. Known as the Ogallala Aquifer, after the Sioux Nation, a Native American tribe, who once hunted buffalo across the plains. So it's known as the High Plains because of its geographic location, or the Ogallala Aquifer, named after the tribe, or one of the tribes, one of the groups who used to hunt on that area. They've chased the people away, but they've used their name. Uh, who hunted across the plains? The underground store stretches beneath most of Nebraska, South Dakota, Western Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas, and parts of Eastern New Mexico, Colorado, and Wyoming. In the 1930s, just 600 wells tapped, in, tapped this aquifer. So just 600 across all of them states, or only 600 that used it. By the late 1970s, there were 200,000 wells. So in 40 years, gone from 600 to 200,000, supplying 22 million acre feet. Okay, so acre feet is a technical word for how um, water is measured. Um, of water a year to more than a third of the country's irrigated irrigated fields. So irrigated a field that is irrigated supplied by water. So a third of all the fields in America were being watered by this aqua, by this body of underground water, trapped water. Many got rich from exploiting the aquifer. Men such as Clarence Jujo bought up huge tracts of Nebraskan sandhills at rock bottom prices and became Sorry, um, huge tracks in Nebraska and Sandhills at rock bottom prices and became the aquifer's biggest pumper. So, Charles Clarence Jujo, or Gigot, I'm not quite sure if he's French or not, what he was able to do was he exploited this water, okay, and he took it out and he built all the pumps and then he sold it. And because people needed the water to grow the crops, people bought it and he had control over this sort of natural commodity. Now, this map here. As we can see, shows us where you'd find it. Remember, it's underground, so you can't see. You can't just fly to Nebraska when it's there. Okay? Nebraska isn't covered in water. Okay? It's covered in grassland. Okay? There's not much in Nebraska. But underneath, okay, in that permeable rock, okay, when you dig down, that's where the aquifer was found. Okay? But as I've said before, this is kind of the heart of America. Okay? You've got the, um, all this area is supplied by it. Now I need you to turn to your books, or turn to your paper, or turn to some word, or how are you doing your work? You need to answer these two questions. Outline the location of the Ogallala Aquifer. So tell me where it can be found. So maybe you can need to start with the country. Then you're going to need to talk about the region. Okay? Maybe you can talk, use the words north, east, south, west. Okay? Mention the states it's in. Mention how big it is. Okay? That's what I want to see for that first answer. Question two. Explain why the aquifer allowed Clarence Jigo, um, Jigo to get rich. So for this one, what you're thinking about, okay, is what's he doing? Well, he buys up the tracts of land, which means he can do what? Well, he can sell that water. And that water was needed because, remember, a third of the fields in America need water from it. And if he's selling that water, he's the one who's making the money. Let's pause and get them two questions answered. The aquifer was an enormous United States resource. 
but also a global one. In a good year, the High Plains could produce three quarters of the wheat traded on the world market. That is a staggering fact. Let's just stop and talk about that again. Three quarters of the wheat traded, so three quarters of all the wheat in the world, okay, was grown on that little strip of land, or oh, not say so little, it's quite large, okay, but on, if you can see, okay, in that dark blue that looks a bit green on my camera, a okay, part of, of America. Okay, that's a lot. Okay, and this could be then used to feed starving Ethiopians, to keep Egyptians fed as the Nile ran dry. Okay, now I've picked that example. It's come from a book from this man called Fred Pierce, which is on the worksheet. Okay, I've, I've got the book on my Kindle, so I can't show you the book. Um, and it's interesting that he uses this example, because especially the group I taught, you can remember this hopefully, we talked about the Nile, and one of the issues with the River Nile is Ethiopia were considering damming it to help feed their population. Now, if Ethiopia dammed the Nile, that impacted um, the Egyptians, but the Nile is already suffering because, of, you know, it's not producing the, quite the levels that it did want to produce. So he, he's talking, he's using that example because it's showing how water conflict is not just in America, it's also all over the world. The US became the world's biggest exporter of virtual water. Okay, and I'm going to put the definition of virtual water on in a minute so you can copy that down. But this is the amount of water that's used to produce anything, crops or any product. But this all came at the expense of draining the Ogallala. The problem is that much of the aquifer uh, is to all intents and purposes a fossil resource laid down in wetter times. Okay, Like I said before, this was laid down millions, hundreds of thousands of years ago. Okay, This can't just refill overnight. Okay, It's been there and it takes a long, long, long time that water to make its way all the way down. Little water is added from today's scanty rain, so scanty limit. Wells have been drying out now for more than 30 years. The first were in Death Smith County in, Texas, in, in the Texas Panhandle. Now the Texas Panhandle, uh, I've not got a great map here, okay, but you can maybe see it. You can always rewind the video back or you can search for it online. Texas at the top of America at the top of Texas, which is that big state in the bottom, that little square bit that little, that comes out. Okay, and that's called the Panhandle. Um, and this is where the wells it was first noticed that the wells were running dry. During the summer of 1970, a well that had been pumping water since 1936 suddenly went dry. Many others have followed. In large parts of the aquifer, two thirds of the water is gone. All new well sinking is banned. In some places and fewer than 10 million acre feet are now pumped annually, less than half the output of the 1970s. Okay, so if there's less water being pumped, that means that they can't grow as many crops, which means what's going to happen to the price of the crops if there's not as many of them? It's going to go up. Okay, how are our poorest people in the world going to find this? Well, if they can't afford the crops and they can't grow their own, Okay, there's no magic answer to this. This increases, um, you know, starvation is increases sort of global problems. Even so, predicts Lawrence Smith of the University of California at Los Angeles. In North Texas, the aquifer will run dry in the next 20 years. Fly over the land and you can see the circular marks where rotating sprinklers once kept the soil wet and the fields green. But the soil is now dry and the fields are brown. The sagebrush bush and buffalo grass are returning. The buffalo may follow. So this really important resource where all, you know, a third of American fields were is drying up and it's being rewilded. Okay, the crops that used to be grown there aren't growing and what's growing is sagebrush and buffalo grass, which are a tougher, hardier grass, which buffalo can eat, um, some cattle can eat, we can't. Okay, so it's going to cause a huge problem. Now, what I'd like you to do is I want two paragraphs at least for this. Explain why the use of the Ogallala aquifer could damage the world. So think about an economic impact. What's it going to mean? OK, how's it going to affect different people? And then think of a social impact. OK, so maybe you could think about the cost of um, wheat here. Again, okay, how's that going to affect? This means that this causes this. To, okay, try and develop it with this means that. And the social impact, this is bad because, okay, maybe you could think about this. 
Think about the farmers. Think about a farmer in Nebraska. If he can't grow his crops, what's going to happen to him? What's that going to mean? What's that going to force him to maybe have to do? Where might he have to move? And when he gets to that place, how is he going to get along? Okay. So can you finally write these two definitions down for me? And then you need to go into your email, go onto forms for eight small questions and two longer questions. Let's get that done and I'll see you soon for our next lesson. Goodbye.